Well, hey guys, good morning and welcome to Mercy Online. I'm your host, Jessica Murray. I'm the communications coordinator right here at Mercy Church. And today, today I'm joined by, I don't know why I delayed that. Good morning. My name is Alan Orohio. I'm the resident church planter here at Mercy Church. Welcome. Yes, we're so, we glad, so glad that, that you guys are here. here. Sorry if, if, if we seem distracted. It's yes. because we're actually celebrating something what are we celebrating? today. We are celebrating our one year one anniversary, year anniversary. Of doing we've been doing this. Mercy Online. And so what's actually happening that you guys at home can't see yes. is our cameraman, Jack Guthrie, and multimedia director, and <laughs> our other cameraman and worship leader, Noah Adderman, they are stretching because they <laughs> were planning to run through the shot. So we're just going to say it one more time. And when we say we are celebrating one year, yes. we're not sure what's going to happen. So we're celebrating <laughs> one year of Mercy Online. <laughs> And these guys, guys, they, they are the ones that actually make the, They do all the work. Yeah, they yeah. make Mercy Online possible. I, I know that you guys know Alan and I yeah. because you see us each week, but the two of them are actually the ones that do all of the work to make this possible. Yeah. We just tell you things. Yeah. So anyways, we have a great time every week. And if you've been yes. with us for the entire year, we would love to know. Just write your name uh, on the drop chat. Drop it in the drop chat. It drop, it, in the drop, chat. It, drop it in the chat. Drop it in the chat. Let us yep. know. And by the way, if this is your first time gathering with us, we are so glad that you're here. We are, really. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. And we would love to know where you are gathering with us from, or yeah. your name. Just drop your name, where you're gathering with us from, on the chat, in the chat. Drop yeah. it in the chat. Drop and it in the chat. Are you watching from the beach? Are you watching from the mountains? Are you watching from your couch? Are you watching from Food Lion? That would be strange. Don't okay, know why. MC Jess. <laughs> but we never know where you guys are watching Mercy Online from. And it's so fun. Yes. We've had people watching from Kenya. We've had people watching from... All over the place, really. Myrtle Beach. I yep. was trying to think of another Myrtle place. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, Alan, why don't we tell them just a few things that we have? Yes. Actually, so, first of all, we started yeah. a new series last week. Song uh, of Songs of Solomon. Songs yep. of Songs. Really good. Plus, this did a great job introducing the book and I would encourage you before you even uh like continue watching continue what not no, what maybe after say? maybe after the okay, second yeah. the second the second sermon yeah. go back and listen to the if first you sermon the first one. if you missed the first yeah. one because it will help you kind of For figure sure. out how to read the, the book how to understand it and what yeah. God says about love yeah and I'm really excited for this series because we're going to be talking about things that we don't normally we don't talk about them often in yes. the church and yes. we really should because right now so through the song of solomon series we're going to talk about things like manhood womanhood yep. dating singleness marriage sexual intimacy like yes. so many different topics that i feel like we're learning from the world day in and day out yes. but what does god actually say about those things yes. and so i'm really excited for what lies ahead. Yes. Yeah. And before we get into service, two things we want to remind you. Oh, by the way, one thing I really am excited about on <laughs> Sunday, last Sunday, we baptized five people. Praises oh, to yes, the Lord. If you did. are feeling like the Lord is calling you into baptism, you yeah. want to come out and make that public profession of faith and obedience to Jesus Christ, would you please let us know in the chat and someone will get back to you, talk to you, tell you uh, what baptism is, and we would love to help you take that step. Yeah. The other thing is we have two studies going on. We do. Uh, the first one started last week. It's yep. the men's Bible study and the women's Bible study. Yes, women's Bible study is beginning the week of September 26th. So yes. you still have time to sign up women we're going to be studying a book by Trilla Newbell yes. and it's a study in Romans 8 Romans 8 yes I just I love that so much that we're like we're not just studying Ruth yes. or Esther which yes. are great great <laughs> women of the Bible yes. but there's so much to be learned from yes. scripture so we just need a diet that encompasses everything and I feel like Romans 8 like it's just gonna it's really gonna change perspectives yes. so I'm really excited if you're a woman out there you should definitely do this study with us. I'll be at one of the sessions, so we'd love to meet you. Um, but yeah, you can go to mercycharlotte.com slash news to find out more about the women's Bible study. And there's actually a lot going on right now. We'll tell you guys more after the sermon. Yes. But there are a lot of events happening at Mercy that are for you guys to learn more about your walk with Jesus. Yes. So, so this is what we're going to do next. We're just going to go into worship. We're going to worship our Lord in music. And then after yep. that, we will worship in listening and worshiping in listening in the sermon. Yeah. And then after that, we'll be back to give you more information. But right now, what I would ask you to do is sing your heart out. Yeah. Let your neighbors know that you're worshiping a living God. And by the way, put your coffee down, hands up. Let's praise the Lord. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. Covering sun with gold. 
you're new with us, this is just week two of a nine-week series that we are walking through the Old Testament book, the Song of Solomon. So you got your Bible, go ahead, flip it out there. If you land in the Proverbs and Psalms, you're close. Okay, just keep flipping. Um, we're going to be in that for nine weeks, and we're going to be talking about God's vision for dating, for romance, for marriage, and yes, we're going to be talking about sex. All right, so this is a, a quick word to any parents in the room who may have been caught off guard by that, because I know it's only week two, if you missed last week. Uh, listen, I think if this were to get a rating in modern day, it would probably be like a, like a PG-13 kind of rating. Um, that said, uh, here's what I think. If you got a middle schooler uh, like I do or a high schooler, I think they need to be uh, in here for this. That would just be me as a parent and, and as your pastor saying that because... Look, you can take them, like I said last week, you can take them out of this room. You can't take them out of the world, all right? The world is giving them a vision for this topic. We want to give them, I do not want any of them to walk out of their days in church, growing up in your home, and think that God has a shroud of shame that comes around this topic, okay? I want them to see God's beautiful design for marriage and romance and intimacy, all that kind of stuff. And I think that's what we're going we're gonna to get in this, all right? But I know I might have caught you off guard. You might feel a little uncomfortable, like I said last week. If you feel uncomfortable, imagine how I feel, okay? Pretty uncomfortable, but it's worth it, worth it to have these conversations. That said, if you want to slip out of the back with your elementary student, um, nobody's going to think anything other than, wow, what a thoughtful parent, really thinking things through, okay? You're going to be fine. Now, last week was an introduction to the Song of Solomon, and we can basically sum up the introduction in two sentences. So if you missed last week, you're okay. Two sentences. The first was talking about, like, what kind of book is this? What's the nature of what we're reading? And what we said is that the Song of Solomon is a love song. It's actually more like a love album. It's an album of songs. Love song, right? Written to give us wisdom. And it's, of course, in the Bible. This thing is a love song. So, of course, King Solomon, our author, stuffs it with imagery and passion. And we're going to see a lot of that even today. But while it is a song, it's written to give us wisdom that plays out in everyday life. So as we're going through this and we're seeing all this imagery and metaphors and all this sort of thing, I promise you it was given to us for real wisdom, to give us wisdom for how to operate in everyday life. And because it's in the Bible, that means we can trust this wisdom as God's wisdom to us, all right? And because it's in Scripture, there's this backdrop that says this is part of a grand story about God's love for us. And we have to see that as we go through this. It's not isolated from the grand story of Scripture that's all about God's redeeming love for us. And that'll play a part every week as we look at this, all right? The second uh, sentence, I would say, that kind of summarized last week in our introduction was not about the nature of the book, but what I'm going to say is just kind of our, our key thesis, and we'll bring it up every week in this. And that's that God is love, God made love, and God gives love. So I'll pursue his way of love in my life. This is so big. God is love. There has to be a true north that we're building. If we're going to talk about love for nine weeks, we better have a sense of a, where do we get it from? What's our definition of it? God is love. That's First John 4. He is love. Now, love is not a God. You compare that to pop culture that kind of worships romantic love as one of its gods. And we say, no, it's actually destructive when you worship love and corrosive and toxic when you worship love as a God. But God is love. It's true to his character. It's who he is. And not only is he love and the source of love, but he made love. He's the one who made love for us. And that means it is good for me to follow his design. He who made me made love, and it's good for me to follow his design, even when his design conflicts with my desires. And y'all imagine that's going to happen a lot, right, in this whole series. And I can trust him in his design, even when it conflicts with my desires, because he desired me so much that he went to the cross for me. It goes right back to the story. And because of that story of his great love for me, I can trust his design because I have seen his desire for me on the cross and in the empty tomb. And then while I figure out how to follow and maybe course correct my life to pursue his way of love in my life, man, I can trust him. Not only can I trust him, I can actually, he, he and his love in the gospel will carry me as I walk with him. All right, that's, the, that's last week. Today and next week, we're going to walk through chapter 1, and I think we're going to get about four to five verses into chapter 2, okay? What we're going to do is we're going to be observers of this romantic dialogue that's starting up between these two, this man and this woman. It'll carry us, of course, through the whole book. So what we're going to do today and next week 
Today, we're going to go through chapter one, and we're going to focus on the man. And I'm going to talk about what it means to be a godly man in light of what we see here, okay? Men, I'm calling you and I out a little bit in that. But don't worry. Next week, we're going through chapter one again, and we're going to talk about what it means to be a godly woman. So ladies, it's coming next week, all right? That's what's going to happen. Now, I do need to say this. While there is going to be a lot in here because of if you're newer to Mercy Church, we just we go through the Bible and try as best we can to let the Bible guide our sermons, and we're just trying to take what's out of the Bible and bring it to bear. So there's going to be a lot in this message on a godly man that's specific to uh, how a man is called by God to relate to his wife. Again, because of the passage. So you might think, well, I'm not a married man. This must not apply to me. For so many reasons, I got to tell you not to tune out. First, it's in the Bible, all right? This is God's word for you. And according to 2 Timothy 3, which you claim to believe, this is God's inspired word to you that is useful and good for you. It's not like we just pick and choose and go, eh, that's not really for me. No, no, it's for you, all right? It may not pack as much punch in this season of life as another one, but I promise you, all scripture is good for you. But secondly, what I hope to be true of our church and of any Christian is that they're living in community with other Christians. And if you are, a passage like this, God is going to use that and then use you to speak some hope into some marriages that you know and that you're around. So this is equipping for you. Uh, this is true for all of us. So uh, not, not even speaking just to the married men here, but think about um, married women for a second. Listen, you need to know what a godly man looks like so that as you see that in your husband, you can celebrate it and encourage it, speak life into it. Because I promise you, y'all, we are uh, married men are the easiest creatures, I would say men in general, very easy creatures to train, okay? You celebrate it, we'll do it again. Like, almost to a fault, okay? That's just kind of pretty simple, simple in how we work and everything, all right? But listen, single men and women, you need to know what a godly man looks like, especially as it relates to relationships. I'm going to bring that up um, from time to time in here, especially today. But the bottom line is, uh, unless you live in a monastery or a convent, this is a very important passage to you in order to participate faithfully and effectively in God's church. All right. With that said, let's get into it. Five characteristics of a godly man. That's our guiding structure. This is not all the characteristics of a godly man. All right. Like I said, the scripture is setting us up for a certain kind of angle we're taking. And it would take me roughly two years to teach you all that scripture says about godly manhood, okay? So let's walk through the conversation. We'll see how he cares for her. We'll see how she responds and speaks about him. All right, you guys ready? Yeah, yeah let's do it. All right, this is verse two of chapter one. This is the woman to the man. Oh, that he would kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your caresses are more delightful than wine. The fragrance of your perfume is intoxicating. All right, here's the first thing that I see here as everybody takes a deep breath and tenses up a little bit, okay? Here's the first thing that I see in here. There's like no um, plot, no setting to the story or anything like that. Like you have the Song of Songs, it's just Solomon. And then you got this character, this woman longing for him to kiss her. And I'm thinking, well, who is this guy you want to kiss you so badly? And who are you, right? I mean, that's, who are these people? What I want you to remember is this is a love song, okay? The tone of their love is as important to the writer as the backdrop of the whole story. And out of the gate, he's saying this is a passionate, romantic love that's being put on display here. She wants him to kiss her. She wants him to hold her. She even switches from the third person to the second person and says, your caresses. It's getting more intimate and so intimate that even his scent is intoxicating to her. Now listen, this dude is a shepherd, all right? Sheep have a certain scent, okay, an aroma that is not intoxicating. It is not even pleasing, all right? So clearly, this dude went home, took a shower, put on some smell good, okay, before he ever comes out to talk to her. And this isn't one of my five sermon points. This is a little extra from Uncle Spence. Listen, guys, it's good to bathe, all right? I would even encourage soap in the process, okay? Um, that is good. All right, and even deodorant and brushing your teeth. All these daily hygiene habits will be good for you in your life, okay? But then verse, verse three, she does a little play on words to get to her real point here. She says, your name is perfume poured out. No wonder young women adore you. In verse four, she's gonna say, it's only right 
that they adore you. It, they don't adore his axe body spray, okay? That's not how the word's getting out around about him, no. His name smells good. And ladies, we've arrived at the, the type of man you need to be looking for here. Yes, you should be physically attracted to him. Yes, he should bathe. But most importantly, he should have great character. Men, do you see what a turn on his character is to her? Look at what she says next, verse four. Take me with you. Let's hurry. Oh, that the king would bring me to his chambers. It is getting hot fast in this. I told you last week, Solomon is not, um, he's not Romeo in our little sonnet here. He is Shakespeare, so to speak, writing this in. So when she says the king, she's not saying just the king like royalty. She's saying, this guy is my king. He is a king to me. And there's actually still a tradition in the Orthodox church. I think it's really great where um, the priest at a wedding will put a crown on the bride's head and on the groom's head. Uh, and for the rest of the day, they'll be treated like royalty among their bridal party and friends and everything because they are one another's king and queen. Y'all, this is, this is so good because his character makes him a king in her eyes. And this is my first of the five and my most important one for us to grab hold of today. A godly man demonstrates and pursues Christ-like character. Demonstrates and pursues. This is the most important thing I'm going to say. And the reason I say Christ-like is because we who have the whole Bible now are able to look back in this and know that God has given us the true model of character, of pure and perfect character, and not just the model, but the source by which we're able to obtain character, and that's Jesus Christ himself. And in fact, this character in Song of Solomon is a foreshadowing of Jesus, just like every single other character you can think of in the Old Testament, whether it's Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, Moses, David, Solomon. All of these guys are pointing you towards the need for a true and perfect Messiah, and that's Jesus. So what we're to do is like Colossians 3 tells us to do, we meant we're to put on Christ. When people look at us, we need to pray, God, I want them to see Christ and not me. And that is a direct affront to the pride in our hearts that says, I want to leave a legacy and a name for myself. So no, 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 we put on Christ. I want them to see Jesus. Doesn't matter about Spence. I want them to see Jesus. But let me give a caveat, um, women. When you're considering a guy or dating a guy or wives, even when you're looking at your husbands, listen, I say demonstrates and pursues because he is not Jesus. He's not Jesus. And we can't put that expectation on our men that you have to be Jesus in order to be worthy. No. What we're saying instead is that he should, you should see something of the character of Christ in him. And he should be pursuing that and striving to look more like Jesus than his first father, Adam. And I'll tell you, as a way to sort of define when I say character... I want to define that for you with something that was given to me when I was 23 years old. We, I did a course on biblical manhood with some folks in our church, and it just stuck with me and has defined my life. I actually use this as a charge I give in every wedding that I do. And so I've done this for some of y'all. Every wedding I do, I give this as a charge to the groom before the bride enters. Everybody else enters, and then she stays back, and I speak directly to the groom to give him a charge, what it means to be a Christ-like man. All right. And I want to give this to you as a definition that has like changed and shaped my life. And so when I say things like Christ-like character, it gives you a little bit of what it means. Here it is. A godly man rejects passivity, accepts responsibility, leads courageously, and expects God's greater reward. This is a godly man. If you know the story of Adam and Eve, Adam sat back and he watched. He offered the first sin was Adam offering his wife up as tribute to whatever might happen here. And ever since, men are prone to sit back and be passive. I know I am. I'm nervous or scared of what might happen and of this mantle of leadership. And in my sin, I want to shrink away from God's design for me. But that's not Christ. That's the first man. That's Adam. Christ wasn't passive. In fact, he accepted responsibility, not just for himself, of course, but for us. He took our sin. This is the, the gospel. You shouldn't be surprised that we're going to build everything off of the gospel around here. That We keep the gospel at the center of all we do. And Christ accepted responsibility, led courageously when it meant going to the cross. 
Men, likewise, we got to put blame shifting to death and lead courageously in whatever space God has called us. And we lead from a place of, not from a place of shame and guilt and I got to do enough and just grit it out. No, we lead from looking at what Christ has done for us, believing in the death and resurrection of Christ for, for our sins, and then leading not just in the model of him, but believing that he will carry us to what he has called us to. And we got to expect God's greater reward. We got to have our eyes fixed on heaven, believing that walking in his design is better for us. It will yield fruit in this life, but it will also prepare us and generations after us for God's eternal glory. And by, by God's grace, he has not designed us to do that alone. He's given us a brothers and sisters to do that among. I especially want to talk about uh, the brothers he's given you. Uh, also. <laughs> I watch this um, TV miniseries every year. It's called Band of Brothers. I think HBO did it like a number of years ago. Uh, it's a little bit old now, like so old, like Ross from Friends is in it. You know, like it's, it's a little bit older. Um, and in there, though, what you have, the reason I, I love watching it is because I want to remember that we, all one another, we are called up to this battle for our own souls and the souls of one another, souls of others. We don't shame one another. Instead, we get in the trenches and we struggle together to become who God has called us to be. So guys, let me ask you some questions. How, how do you treat the people around you? As you hear that definition, how do you treat the people around you? How do you treat your kids? How do you treat your parents? How do you treat your spouse? How do you treat your coworkers? How do you treat your friends, your employees, your neighbors? Are you a servant of others? Do you serve them? Are you even proactively you're rejecting passivity and proactively seeking to accept responsibility? Do you blame shift? Is that a pattern of yours? Are you responsible? Are you faithful to your word? Are you self-controlled? Guys, if you're dating, can you keep your hands off of her? Are you self-controlled? That's a fruit of the spirit. Men, married men, can you keep your hands off of her? Can you respect her and honor her with your words? Or can you keep your hands off of yourself? Are you self-controlled? Listen, the man God has made you to be, he's a man that centers his life on Jesus. I'm not asking you to be perfect. You can't be. I can't be. And the reality that we can't be perfect should further reinforce how dependent on Jesus we need to be. He's not just the model for manhood. He's the source we draw strength from. And the most important thing, guys, the most important thing you can do to be the man God has called you to be, and you can start no matter where you are, in your age, life stage, the most powerful thing you can do to be a godly man is to spend time with God. If you need help with that, ask people in your community group, in any community group, come right down here after the service, and we'll talk about what does it mean to spend time with God each day. That's godly character. Let's keep going. I want you to look back at, um, at verse 3, where she says, No wonder young women adore you. Because now those young women, as we go into verse 4, they're going to speak. The young women say, We will rejoice. This is them saying this to their sister, the, the woman. We will rejoice and be glad in you. We will celebrate. Remember where the woman said, Your caresses more than wine? They're saying, We're going to celebrate that desire that you have. Your caresses more than wine. And the woman responds, it's only right that they adore you. Let me explain who this they are, who these young women are. Think of this like a play. In fact, if you're reading your Bible, you probably have like almost like a script a little bit, like the woman says, and then the man says, and the young women say, right? Um, if this is a play, her friend group is kind of that chorus in the background commenting on what's going on. Um, I was told this week that a way to describe them would be, this is her bride tribe. Okay, so that's, if that makes sense to you, that was new to me. Um, they, they're chiming in, they're commenting on what's going on. And let me say something important. This is like good and healthy and what should happen in a relationship that is God honoring. This group of girls is excited for their friend. They see this guy. They see what this relationship is doing to her. It's super positive, and so they affirm it. And this is the second characteristic of, of a godly man. A godly man has a godly reputation among his peers. He's the same person with others that he is with her. Y'all, if you are dating a guy and your Jesus-loving girlfriends are not celebrating, if instead they're warning you, 
You need to first thank God that he put them in your life and either address it now or get out of that relationship. You know, I, I was something I've been thinking and praying on um, as we get into the series that what I hope happens is I hope some, um, I'm praying, it's kind of a weird prayer, but I'm hoping some engagements happen as a result of this series because uh, the course of friends that are going to affirm relationship and I'm praying that some breakups happen because you're listening to your friends. It's not going to be because of me. It's going to be because you're listening to your friends who are trying to speak truth and love to you. And you trusting God has placed them in your life. And you, listen, this statement, if you only knew him like I did, is a dangerous thought that has kept many people in unhealthy, toxic, God-dishonoring relationships. And by the way, this shouldn't stop once you get married. Right? Women should encourage one another in marital love, and so brothers should encourage one another as well. We got The whole point is, what I love about this friend group being a part of the Song of Solomon is we have to be for one another in the church. Their love, their, their, what we're going to see is that even their romantic, uh, the dating period, and then marriage. It's all kind of, there's, of course, some private time. We're going to talk about that, okay? But it's also like public. They're known. And what we tend to do is have a public wedding and a private marriage, Instead of being known in our relationships by one another so that we can call one another out when we're running away from God's design and celebrate when we're running towards it. And we'll see more of that next week. All right, verse five. She goes and she talks to her bride tribe. Daughters of Jerusalem, I'm dark like the tents of Kedar, yet lovely like the curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I'm dark for the sun has gazed on me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me take care of the vineyards, and I'm not taking care of my own vineyard. She's been out in the sun, working long days, exposed to the sun, and so her skin is dark from all of that. What we're learning here, what she's communicating by having this job is that she's not royalty. She's a woman with a tough job, and she can't really lean on her family for support. Now, this is big. She does not hate herself. Okay, this isn't bad self-image. She recognizes she is lovely. And we'll talk about that more next week. But she's being aware here. She's being kind of realistic about the hand that she's been dealt. And there's this little hint of disappointment that seems to be in there that she can't take care of herself like she wants to. And what she's doing, she's sharing that with her friends. And then verse 7, she turns to her man and she says, Tell me, you whom I love, where do you pasture your sheep? Where do you let them rest at noon? Why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? Even though she's been in this spot where she's like, I wish I could take care of myself a little bit better. She says, I'm not going to just stay in the crowd. I'm going to take a step out. And what's happening here? She wants to come visit him at work. She's like, when's your lunch break? What you doing? Where you at? You know, that's what's happening here, right? So she's asking, where do you tend your sheep? And now in verse 8, we hear the man speak for the first time, and I watch how he addresses her. If you do not know, most beautiful of women. I love that it's poetry because a couple of things are happening. First, he's saying, yeah, if you don't know where I am, let me give you directions. All right. But secondly, he's saying, if you do not know, most beautiful of women, what he's doing is he's speaking already right back to her self-image and saying, no, if, do you not know that you're the most beautiful of women? It's like you don't know. There's so much that you don't know that I'm going to speak life into you. Follow the tracks of the flock and pasture your young goats near the shepherd's tent. She thinks she is common. And he's saying, no, you're anything but common. That's going to be a big theme. You, you are the most beautiful of all women. He keeps going. And you remember this verse from last week, verse 9. I compare you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Remember, this is imagery. He's not saying you got a horse face or something like that, right? Look, the best mare, this is a female horse, in an army, and you got to think Pharaoh's army, which is the greatest army in the world, right, was often sent out. They would select the best mare. I don't know how you select the best mare, okay? That's beyond my skill set and area of expertise. I just know this was the best one, all right? And he's saying the best one was often selected to send out to the opposing army as they're lined up because it would rile up all the stallions on the opposing army line. And what he's saying is she is the most beautiful of women. Seeing her gets him as near out of control and excited as a war horse. All right? He's excited. But more than that, she isn't just beautiful. Like this mare is extremely valuable. She's the best woman there is. And he's speaking that over her. He treasures 
her. And this is a theme you'll see throughout the book. A godly man, this is what I want to tell you, a godly man treasures the woman that God gives to him. There's just nothing in this whole book where he takes her for granted. Nowhere. She is a treasure to him. And yes, I know this is early. This is chapter one. It's kind of their dating relationship where they're googly eyes all the time at one another. But I'm telling you, this flame only intensifies by the end in chapter eight. Doesn't dwindle. And that's a word to us, men. I'm about to talk about your words in a second. But before that, I want to talk about your heart and your mind. And unmarried men, I want you to bear with me for a second and learn a lesson here as I talk to married men. Down in your heart of hearts, where only you and the Lord know what's going on, do you treasure your wife? Do you treasure her? Do you see her as when Solomon wrote Proverbs, he's talking to his son. He says, Proverbs 18, 22, he who finds a wife finds a good thing, obtains favor from the Lord. She's a blessing from the Lord to him. Proverbs 19, 14, a house and wealth, these are inherited from fathers, but a prudent wife, that's a gift from the Lord. Your wife is a gift from God to you. God looks at her, calls her daughter, adorns her with his very image. He gives Adam the whole world and says, it's good. But when he gave Eve to Adam, he said, now this is very good. And I say that because it's so easy for us as husbands to slip into this pattern of taking our wives for granted. Sometimes it's even worse. Sometimes husbands get bitter after five years or 15 years or, or 25 years, and they look at their wives and be like, really? This is the person that I'm stuck with the rest of my life? Maybe she's Maybe it's even worse, like she's hurt you or and you've never dealt with it or you're just kind of simmering. Maybe you're frustrated because, I mean, she ain't trying to visit me at work and bring her goats to my pasture, right? She's not talking about my caresses and kisses and all this kind of thing. And what happens is you start to think, I deserve better. And the reality check on us men is you don't even deserve her. You don't deserve her. She's a gift that God has given to you. And, and that's a hard word to all of us husbands, but it's a good one. It's needed. Maybe you should stop blaming her for the flame getting low. Instead, repent to God for where you have not treasured the queen that he entrusted to you. And y'all, you might be thinking, yeah, but there was some real harm that happened in our marriage. Maybe she was unfaithful to you or something like that. I don't want to shortchange that. In fact, there's a whole book that walks through that storyline called the book of Hosea. You see Hosea pursue his wife. And that's actually a picture of God pursuing unfaithful Israel. And as his wife continues to cheat on him and cheat on him, he continues to be faithful towards her. And I would tell you to go to that and see above all God's love for you, which actually gets right to the point in the real heart of this. Cause I can almost always connect a lack of treasuring God's gift with a lack of treasuring God himself. See your heart towards God ain't right. That's why you don't treasure his gifts because you don't treasure him. I mean, think about it. Um, when I got engaged, when Courtney and I got engaged, I went out and I bought this ring and it had a diamond on it. Y'all, this thing was so expensive. It was like, and I was 21 years old. I think, I, I know it was the most expensive thing I ever bought. I was thinking about it today. I think I spent more on that than I did on anything I ever bought altogether up to that point in my life. Like you had all the Wendy's Frosties up to that point that I bought and that thing is still more expensive, right? It was valuable, no doubt, on its own, extremely valuable. But it was uniquely and remains uniquely valuable to her because of who gave it to her and what it meant. The same is true with the way that you treasure your wife. She's a treasure all on her own. A beautifully, divinely crafted daughter of God. But that's not all. She's a gift from God to you. And you won't get treasuring her right until you get treasuring God right. So what do you do? Well, it starts with repenting of your sin. It starts with turning back to God and repenting to God for where you have not treasured him rightly. This is David when he goes back and after making all sinning against so many people, all these bad decisions that create so much destruction. And he turns, he looks at God and says, against you and you only have us sinned because I've not treasured and valued you rightly. Ask God to help you see him rightly. And then, then you go and you repent to her. You do. And you, like with words, like create time, write it down if you need to and go out somewhere 
and, and make the time. Uh, don't go out to somewhere like Popeye's, okay? That's not where you're going, uh, unless that like, has a special meaning to you, you know? And then, like, I'm not knocking that chicken sandwich. It's good, okay? But unless that's, you go somewhere where you can actually sit down and spend some time and you honor her, right? She's your queen. You say, I'm sorry, where I've not valued you as that gift God made you to be. Apologize not just for your lack of words and actions, but for the heart that led to those lack of words and actions. I think we'll become better husbands, men, when we see our wives rightly as divine image bearers placed providentially in our lives to show us more of the greatness of God. And then with our hearts right, then we can use our words. Last thing I want you to do, I do not go speak in empty words. It's not going to help anything. It's why you got to get your heart right. You got to let the Lord get your heart right. Go on to verse 10. Your cheeks, he says, are beautiful with jewelry. Your neck with its necklace, we will make gold jewelry for you, accented with silver. Uh, I want to include verse 15 right here because he's doing the same thing uh, in all this. How beautiful you are, my darling. How very beautiful your eyes are doves. He starts up here, guys, up here. Starts up here with the face. He's going to work down, but he starts here, right? And I want to say this. A godly man uses his words to build up. To build up. Words are powerful. They're so powerful. You know this. I know this. I grew up, um, guys are, or some guys are different, but I grew up learning how to use words as my weapon. I was not the smartest guy. I was not the uh, best athlete. So I learned how to use words to mask my insecurity, whether for humor or for throwing a dig at somebody. And you start to grow up, you go into adulthood, and you ain't figured out how to deal with your insecurities like, like I did. You can use your words to create some real pain. You take that into marriage and create some real problems. Some of you are the opposite, though, of guys like me who use a whole bunch of words. You use relatively no words unless absolutely necessary, right? Like she asks you, how was your day? That is an invitation to intimacy. That's I want to know you again today, afresh today. And you say, whilst chewing your chicken, fine. <laughs> and you genuinely mean it. Like it wasn't especially a good day, especially a bad day. The proper word to use to describe this day is fine. And so that's what you say. And then you, you know, go on with your nightly routine. You go to the couch, whatever your normal routine is. And then you wonder, though, you wonder why she doesn't respond excitedly to you when you roll over in your bed once a week and kind of lift your eyebrows and go, you know, <laughs> of course not. You got to recognize that intimacy begins way before the bedroom. All right. You got to use your words. In the words of Billy Joel, you need to tell her about it. Tell her everything you feel. That's for everybody in the room my age or older, okay? The rest of y'all deal with it. All right, go look it up. Well, I want you to see how intentional this guy is with his words. He builds her up. He's attentive, and then he uses his words to build her up. Um, go to uh, chapter 2 right at the beginning, verses 1 and 2. He's doing the same thing here, so let's bring that in. The woman says, I'm a wildflower of Sharon. This is the same thing she was saying earlier. Like, don't look at me because I'm common. I'm a wildflower of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. And the man says, like a lily among thorns, so is my darling among the young women. She's saying there's nothing special about me. I'm a dime a dozen. He says, nah. And he recreates her using her own metaphor. That's how much he's listening. If you're a lily, then you are the one and only lily and everything else is thorns. It's like he puts that girl in portrait mode, the new thing on the phone, you know, where everything else just kind of blurs out. And you're the only one that's there. You're so beautiful. Everything else, it's, it's nothing. It's thorns. And by the way, guys, this should not just be true in our romantic uh, relationships and our marriage. This should be true in all relationships. We should try to see others as God sees them and use our words to call people up to who he is calling them to be and has designed them to be. This should be true of the church, men and women. Like, you know how easy it is. It only takes a few words to tear somebody down. It takes so many to build them up. It's because we're all so insecure. That's because we have a divine image imprinted on us and sin has confused it. And we need to be called back to who God created us to be. God gifts each one of us as believers with spiritual gifts. We have the Holy Spirit in us. He's given us spiritual gifts. How are we to know what they are? Well, we're going to start figuring out when we speak it over one another and identify it. I see this in you. I see this in you. I see this in you. Nothing is so powerful as being truly seen in who God made you to be and then called up. And of course, it's true in romantic love. He's saying, I see you. It's going to come out so many times. The reason, y'all, the reason this book is so sensual 
is because of how much attention to detail they see in one another and they speak it over one another. Right? So let me give you some, uh, we're going to call this soul work, not homework, because we all maybe didn't like homework or you work from home, right? And so you're just tired of home and work being together. So let me give you some soul work from your pastor for you this week. For husbands first, then I'll give some for all of us. Husbands, I want you to identify something specific that you love about your wife's character. And I want you to identify something specific you love about her physical appearance. And I want you to tell her about it this week. All right? Where do you see Christ in her character? What do you love about her appearance? Just modeling after this guy. Now, let me give you some homework, soul work for all of us. If you're not a married guy, listen, identify something specific and Christ-like about someone's character and tell them about it. If you're not a married man, don't do the first one, okay? Don't be walking around pointing out things. Like that. Don't, don't make it weird, okay? Just do this one, all right? It's going to be, I, I think we got to get in the pattern of this. And by the way, she responds so positively to this. Who doesn't? Look at verse 16. Well, how handsome are you, my love? How delightful. Our bed is verdant. Verdant means green. It means alive. It's springtime in their love. It's springtime in their bed. This, their, their bed is blooming. Their love is blooming. And she's laying on that bed, looking up. She says, the beams of our house are cedars and our rafters are cypresses. Let me tell you um, this last thing that I've got. Just again, like I said, it's from this passage. There's so many more, but last thing I see here, and then I'll explain it. A godly man creates security for his wife. She's looking at the house. It's, it's sturdy and safe, and she feels secure there. He's got a job and a home. He's creating security for her in that. Now, remember, she also has a job. She's got at least two, right? She's got out in the vineyards, and then she got them goats. Like, she's doing stuff with them too, right? And by the way, the same guy that wrote this, wrote Proverbs, which means he wrote Proverbs 31. That woman had at least three jobs and was just running the thing, okay? The point is not whether or not his income exceeds her income, okay? Get that. The point is, he creates a sense of security for her. He makes his house their home, and she feels secure in that. And look, verse 3, we'll kind of allude to it. Chapter 2, verse 3. She says, like an apricot tree among the trees of the forest. So she's keeping the uh, vegetation metaphor, but she knows that he doesn't want to be a flower. But you call him a tree? He's like, oh, yeah, I'm a tree, right? It's a little bit more what a guy likes, so, uh, or what her guy likes, right? So an apricot tree among the trees of the forest So is my love among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. (laughs) Yes, that last line has a double meaning. Security for her is an aphrodisiac. And I'm not just talking, I'm talking about emotional security, relational security, financial security. What this is all doing is she trusts him. Right? She trusts him to care for her and she flourishes. She is flourishing and delighting in that security. Guys, yes, this means you should be responsible adults if you're going to marry a woman. No, you do not have to be able to build a house out of cedar and cypress with your bare hands. All right? I mean, that's cool if you can do that, but that's not the measure of a man. The measure of a man is are you working hard not just to win a bride, but to build trust and security that will provide and help them to flourish as a part of your family. Now, fellas, listen, I talked about this earlier, and I want to go back to it. The enemy would love nothing more right now than to shame us for how we have not measured up to God's calling on our lives. I, y'all, I mean, I'm sitting here preaching a message that I know I've not lived out perfectly. This homework is my homework for us for, as we do this. So I want to draw you to a verse as we close that I hope will give you some courage as you walk into this week. It's 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And Paul says, he said to me, Jesus said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is actually perfected in your weakness. So Paul says, well, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. Your inability to perfectly obey Christ is the indicator. It should be like a tuning fork in your heart that causes you to kneel causes you to kneel and say, God, you, your grace is going to have to be the thing that allows me to be, that makes me into the man that you're calling me to be. 
I told you God is love, God made love, and God gives love, so I'll pursue his way of love in my life. His way begins not in our own strength. It's not picking up the mantle, it's kneeling. It begins in admitting we cannot do this apart from him and his strength. So guys, I want to call you to, to faith, to trusting in the Lord never had. I want to call you to repentance, and maybe that's going to be a part of your steps this week. I want to call you to the belief that the power of God is in you. In fact, yeah, I did this first service. I think it's the right thing to do. I want to ask the men in the room to stand up. Go ahead. Stand up. Here, if you're online, if you're northeast, wherever you are, stand up. Brothers, I want to speak the charge over you that I speak to those grooms when they're getting married. I want to remind you first, Joshua 1.9. This guy Joshua is about to carry Israel into a lot of battles, and he's supposed to take over from Moses. He says, I don't know if I can do this. And the Lord says to him, be strong and courageous. For the reason why, the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And the people of Israel that they're charged to lead, they say, we'll, we'll follow We'll follow, just make sure to be strong and courageous. Don't drift to the right or to the left from God's word. Stay on his word and we'll follow. Be strong and courageous for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Brothers, it is not your strength or my strength. That will run out. I don't care how strong you are. It is the Lord's strength in you that will shape you. The spirit of God, if you're a follower of Christ, it'll shape you into the man he's called you to be. So I want to ask you, I want to charge you. There's four things. And if you'll accept this charge, I want you to respond by saying, we will, when I finish. Brothers, will you reject passivity, accept responsibility, lead courageously, and expect God's greater reward? Let me pray for you. God, what a gift that we have Christ. Thank you for him. As as these men are here standing before one another, standing before you ultimately. I pray that you would use today to fan the flame of faith in them. In fact, men, if, you, if you've never given your life to, to Christ and as you're standing there, we need moments like this. And maybe you're, what you need to do in this moment is say, God, I recognize that I've never really received the gift of salvation. I've been trying to walk through life my own strength. You just pray to him now. Say, God, I repent of my sin. And I believe Jesus died for it. And I receive the forgiveness that you offer me in Christ. Thank you, God, for saving me. God, help us not to just be strong men. No. Help us to recognize that we are weak. But in our weakness, that's where you come in. And we experience the sufficiency of the grace of Christ. And then we're made strong through you. Apart from you, we can do nothing. Would we recognize that as we go into this week? Thank you for the gift of Jesus. Thank you for the hope that he is for us. Father, not not in shame do we leave here today, not in guilt, but in hope, in joy, in the peace and security of Christ. And the hope of what you have called us to, we walk. We do it in the resurrected name of Jesus. Amen. I cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds, his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore for endless days.
I'll say it again. I, I love, love worshiping, worshiping with, with our, our church. church. I do. It's we need such a t-shirt a that says "I love worshiping with we my church." We need Mercy a online. t-shirt, and then we could just send them to you guys. Like that would be amazing. It, sh- it should be like a quote with Jessica Murray on it. Oh, when did you goodness. first say it? 2021. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> the year I don't know. of our Lord. I don't know what month it was. We've been doing this for a whole year now. So crazy. Can't believe it. We're so glad you guys have been with us for a year. Yes. But wow, what a sermon. All about manhood. You feel like you know Great. more about Great. manhood now? I, I feel I feel challenged. <laughs> yeah. I feel um, encouraged, mm-hmm. uh, called uh, called dab yeah. to live up to what God's idea of a man uh, was when he created us in his own image. Yeah. So it, it's wonderful. I, I think every man should go back and re-listen to it this yeah. week. Maybe write some notes and even ask your wife or uh, sisters in Christ uh, close to you. Like, hey, how am I not living up to this? Could yeah. you help me? Because all of us have blind spots. Right. And actually, that's a great point because or what I was thinking while you were saying that is yeah. if you guys are watching online and you ever miss a sermon and yes. you don't know where to go to find yes. it. You can find our sermons either online at mercycharlotte.com slash sermons, or you can search Mercy Church on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, and our sermons are there. Yes. So you can go back and listen to any that you missed. Um, and next week, ladies, our week is coming. So ladies. manhood was this week, but next <laughs> week is womanhood. So definitely come back because yes. I'm really excited to hear what we're going to learn yes. that week. Yeah. So anyways... All right, what do we have for them before we get out of here, Alan? We've got the the, the conference we do. that is coming up. You want me to tell them about it? Yes, please. Absolutely. That would be great. So during our Song of Solomon series, we are having an equip forum that is going to take place over a weekend, October 22nd, 23rd, and technically the 24th, but yes. that will be a Sunday morning. So we're going to have guest speakers coming in 
Dr. Degler and Dr. Timothy Atik. Yes. And I believe we may have one more, mm -hmm. but they're still working out a few things there. But basically this, I didn't even tell them the title of yes. what this weekend is called. <laughs> it's the Redeeming Sex Weekend. Yes. And so you can go to mercychallet.com slash news and you can see the schedule for the weekend. Yes. There are going to be some deep dive sessions. There's going to be a woman women's only session. Yes. Just a great opportunity to learn more. What does God and the word of God say about sex? Yes. Sexual intimacy, sexual integrity. Yes. I don't know. I can't all, remember all, all of the, the different above. things. Because but if you, all of the above. <laughs> even from last week, when you think about what Pastor Spence said, when yeah. your sixth grader is asked, uh, how do they identify? Yes. We are in a new era. That's and so, so that true. means that we have to take this seriously. Yeah. And this is actually a very easy way to invite someone to come to the conference. You'll be like, hey, yeah. my church, they are talking about sex on this weekend. And someone will be like, yeah. what? Hold up. They're what like, do you mean? Talk about and then that? they'll be like, okay, I guess I'll go hear yeah. what the church has to say. Because yeah. there's a lot of stereotype right. around what church says when yeah. it comes to sex. And, and so this weekend's going to be for everyone. It's for whether you're everyone. single, whether you're widowed, whether you're married, whether yeah. you're same sex attracted, there are going to be things for you to learn from this weekend. So we definitely encourage you to come to that. How can I sign up if I want to come? Just Mercy, Char Mercy Charlotte. That was going to say it. I was going to say it so fast. I couldn't even say it. Mercycharlotte.com slash news. You guys know that. Our, our viewers know. Fantastic. They and know. then on the on the 28th, September 28th, we have the Mission of God class. Yes. Now, mm -hmm. this is a class that is going to take six weeks and mm -hmm. you are going to be taught how to have your eyes wide open for what the mission of God is. Yeah. And sometimes when we talk about missions, people think, oh, this is for the missionaries. This is for like the I people. I have to have a special I calling. I have a special mm -hmm. calling to yeah. go to a different country, to go but to a different place. And that's, that's okay. Not, yeah. But that's not all it is exactly. when we talk about missions. Exactly. God has destined all people who believe in him mm -hmm. to take up this mission to go spread the gospel. And that might look like you going to your office and just talking to your neighbor. Yeah. You going to the grocery store and yeah. talking to the to the lady at the, the what is it called? The, the checkout. Cashier. And saying, yeah. hey, what's your name? Yeah. How do you even have those gospel conversations so yeah. that you're part of the mission of God? And all yeah. those things, I know sometimes, like for students, when they hear talking to someone about Jesus, they are so afraid. They're scared of yeah. going to the cafeteria and talking to someone right. about Jesus. This will definitely give you the confidence, handles. the yeah. clarity, even the the God idea. What what yeah. does God want me to do? Yeah. And how has he done it? And you will see it because he has done it from Genesis all through Revelation. He's yeah. always seeking people. We serve a missionary God. Yeah. So this is a class to sign up for. It's um, September 28th. Yes, Mission of God class. For how, can, how can you sign? I just, I just yes. realized I didn't say where to sign up for <laughs> no, it. No, you're totally fine. <laughs> so for information on any of the things we talk about yes. during this, you can go to mercycharlotte.com slash news and you can see all the events that are happening in the life of Mercy. So it's a really great resource. Last thing, let me tell you, I love working at Mercy Church. <laughs> She loves working in Mercy Church. We love working here. And we have some openings. We are. We're hiring. Go to the website. <laughs> check out how many jobs we have on there. Yes. Maybe something that fits with you and apply. Yeah. Come join the fun team. Yes. The absolutely. God fun team. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Well, we should probably let you guys get out of here. So I think we don't have anything else, right? Nope. That's it. Just All Mercy right. Shallowed. MercyShallowed.com slash news. That's what I'm going to get on a t-shirt. MercyShallowed.com slash news. You are said.